Hello everyone, welcome back. I'm very happy that you're joining me again. I hope you've had a good week, practiced well, feeling inspired, um, and you're learning lots of new skills as we go along. So today's lecture is all about sound. Music, the sound of music, is the reason why I started playing music in the first place. Perhaps that's true for many of us. I found that I loved the feeling of creating sound and the feeling of being enveloped in the music. And certainly in conversations with colleagues and students over the years, I've discovered it's a common theme. Now, as proficient players delving into the sound world of master composers on a daily basis, we are expressing their feelings and ours with sound. It can be a very special experience, often extraordinary and sometimes life enhancing. We might find communicating with sound is much more direct and complete than communicating with words. Music, as you know, is just a multitude of various sounds that have been assembled to create a piece of music, a work of art. Those of you who compose music will intimately understand and be involved in this process. As musicians, sound is our trade, so we need to deeply and intimately understand what it is and how we live and work with it. Sound becomes music, which is a language. The more profound our understanding of music and the more clearly and fluently we speak it, the better we communicate it to others and with others. Let's look at the basics of sound, the effect sound has on humans in raw form. The sound we hear and feel is actually a vibration that travels as a sound wave. From its source, sound radiates through the air or water and we hear it through our ears and skin and our body. It is a wave that literally moves the air, that breaks the stillness. I feel that it's truly amazing that experiencing a movement of air can make us feel such powerful and varied emotions. I've spoken with scientists specialising in music and the brain and they said that although they could see the areas of the brain that deal with emotions reacting to vibrations, they have found no way to predict or map the immense variety of continually changing emotions music causes or understand why everyone reacts in their own way. Once again, it confirms that music is a powerful force and is so much more than something measurable. Music is like a sense, like a smell that can conjure memories. It's an energy that can make us feel warm or cold. It's a stimulant that can excite us. It can make us incredibly sad or wildly happy. It can be frightening, disturbing and shocking. But what is really fantastic is that it can do all this without ever harming us. It's the perfect life enhancing drug that only has good side effects. Thinking about this, can you imagine life without any music? A sound wave has a pattern, a frequency. When we receive the wave, it's in the form of a micro rhythm. The rhythm is mostly too fast for us to recognise as a rhythm. We hear it as a sound pitch, but if the pitch is really low, we can sometimes hear the beats, the lowest notes on a huge organ, for example, you can also hear the beats when you're tuning your instrument, tuning one string while also playing another. When the beats are audible, the strings are not in tune with each other. The same when you tune a piano. Actually, while I'm talking about tuning, I should mention that hearing these beats on open strings and tuning until the beats disappear is the only accurate way to tune. The very commonly used method of playing a harmonic on one string and comparing it to its pitch on the same note on another string is unreliable. Natural harmonics are unfortunately not in tune with the open strings as we often find when we're playing music. Back to sound. The sounds we hear from nature are very clear. The gentle lapping of waves on the seashore are calming and soothing. 
the regular rhythmic pattern and the smoother higher frequency vibrations incorporating a lot of white noise allow us to bask in the gentleness. A clap of thunder, on the other hand, is a frightening, disturbing and shocking noise. It's a sudden and unpredictable sound with a huge spectrum of frequencies. It's not just the volume that is disturbing. After all, we often hear thunder a long way away. It's the particular pattern of vibrations that have that effect on us. Our instincts make us wary of the sound. It's our animal instinct. You'll recognise composers stimulating our animal instincts to get the reactions and emotions they want. For example, the bass drum roll, emulating the sound of distant thunder. We sense our nervousness, our vulnerability. Sounds that humans make also elicit clear reactions. A crying baby makes a sound that is piercing to the ear, demanding and tiring. It uses this type of sound to attract its mother's attention. No words are necessary. Then the mother uses warm vocal tones in her voice to calm the baby. She pats or rocks the baby rhythmically. She stimulates the vibrations the baby was so familiar with in the womb. Sounds that had no jagged edges that burbled around the mother's regular heartbeat. One technique used in yoga you'll perhaps know about is singing a long, deep oom. It relaxes us and fills our bodies with good vibrations. It's healing and it focuses our minds on our bodies. Speaking of animal instincts, you may recognise this next experience. At the end of a concert, someone comes to congratulate you. They make a comment about the music but then immediately apologise, saying they're embarrassed to be saying anything to you about the music because they've had little or no training at all. I always say, you really don't need to know anything. Please don't be embarrassed. It's fantastic that you've responded to the music freely and followed your instincts. After that, feeling more comfortable, they enthusiastically express in great detail how much they loved a particular piece or even their specific reaction to a single moment in the music. Of course, they might also explain why they didn't like a particular piece. The most truly incredible moments have been when someone tells me how the music has changed their life in some way. Fundamentally, they've used their animal instincts. The challenge for us is to listen to our sound in the way the audience hears it, to use our animal instincts and to think what direct human reactions our sound evokes. I've commonly heard from students how when they've recorded themselves, they've been surprised in how different things have come out compared to how they thought they played. So our goal must be to hear properly from the outside while we play. Only then can we start to mould the sound correctly. We must learn to be simultaneously both the player and our audience. Here's a tip that really helps us to learn to listen from the outside, to get us out of our own head and listening more objectively. Find an object or a focal point to look at as far away from you as possible. Now, play through a section of music and keep looking at that point as you play. Some people find it very hard not to look away frequently. When you can keep on focusing on that spot, you'll find yourself listening in a different way. It's as though you moved your ears to that place and now you're listening like someone in the concert hall. The source of sound. We must also understand what is the real source of our sound and how we initiate sound. Of course, our instrument is silent. It does nothing without us. Do you know the story about the man who came backstage after listening to the great violinist Yasha Heifetz and said, Mr. Heifetz, your violin sounds so beautiful. Heifetz lifts his violin to his ear and said, I don't hear anything. 
The true source of our sound is our personal energy, a combination of musical desire and will and our passion. With this energy, we create physical movement. We craft and choreograph our movements so that they cause the instrument to vibrate, to resonate in a very specific way. Our instrument amplifies our energies. If you put the bow on the string and bow back and forth, hoping for good sound, you'll certainly be really disappointed. It'll be a kind of noise, an empty, unexpressive sound. You can see robots on YouTube bowing the strings of a violin with perfect technique. They sound, well, like robots. It's absolutely dreadful, even playing a great instrument. As musicians, we can get depressed instantly when our sound is lacking in quality. Even when we hear just a couple of notes that sound like noise, not music. You can make a simple experiment. Compare the sound you make starting a piece without breathing and without anticipation to the sound you make taking an upbeat breath and anticipating the sound you want to make. I'll give you an example. I'll start with the opening of the Elgar Concerto without breathing before I start. the sound I want to make. efficient, powerful and sophisticated way, we first need to attend to ourselves. By this I mean we must learn to be extremely aware of our body and how we feel and how we think. Only after this should we consider how we handle instrument and how to make it sing for us. Since our instrument responds to our physical movement, there are fundamentals about our physique and the way we use our bodies that we must understand well. Physical freedom, even the tiniest tension, is detrimental to your sound, tensing your jaw, frowning, gripping the instrument, the tension when lifting your feet off the ground, lifting your shoulders. I'll demonstrate. Firstly, I'll play with my shoulders up. my feet off the ground, my heels off the ground. And now with my feet back on the floor. You should absolutely try these demonstrations yourself. Experiment with what affects your sound, whether it's a dramatic change for the good or bad, or even a small improvement. I don't think there's a day that goes by when I'm playing the cello that I don't make tiny adjustments to check if I can make a better sound more easily and feel yet closer and more expressive with the instrument. 
In fact, it can happen several times in a day, especially when I'm searching for a particular sound in a phrase. Do you play tennis or have you watched tennis? Playing a musical instrument is similar to playing tennis or for that matter golf and other sports. When you swing at the ball you need balance, a relaxed but secure structure in your hands and a follow through. If you grip the racket too tightly or have your shoulders tensed or stop your swing the moment you hit the ball, the ball will go nowhere. Being relaxed, balanced and structured and using the racket as an extension of your body, you use your energy to swing your body with the racket towards the ball. As you're swinging, the racket head meets the ball. The ball absorbs all the energy you've created in your body, takes off and flies through the air. And remember, our swing continues into the follow through. The follow through is as important as the preparation, breath and anticipation of movement. It's rather like a spring first coiling up and then uncoiling, releasing our energy. For us musicians, we can say our bow is in effect like the tennis racket. It's an extension of our body that helps us release energy into the string. So do we also need strength? We certainly need strength of mind and enough strength to have a good structure in our body in order to stand and sit well. A general fitness so that our muscles don't tire easily, so that we can breathe easily and so we're able to make quick changes of direction in our movements with ease. But actual physical strength is not what we require to play our instruments. You see this in the example of a brilliantly talented 12 year old they have relatively undeveloped strength, and yet they can be powerful players. Equally, you won't play louder because you've built big biceps in the gym. Isaac Stern probably made more sound on the violin than anyone I've ever heard, but he was not tall, and I'm pretty sure he never picked up a dumbbell weight in his life. So rather than actual strength, we're looking for relaxation with minimum tension. A minimum tension that allows us to hold that good posture and good structural positions in our hands that allows us freedom for the slow and fast muscle movements required. Which brings me to physical balance and why this affects our sound. I'll demonstrate why we need to find good overall balance, a position for sitting or standing when we play. I'm standing well balanced and speaking strongly. Listen to the resonance in my voice. Now I'll lift one foot off the ground. Now there's much less resonance and it's very hard to speak strongly. I'm not kidding it, I'm not tricking you. It just really is hard even to get my voice to go out to you. And also because there's so much tension in my body lifting the leg up, restricting the resonance and therefore the sound diminishes. I'll put my foot down now. When we play or sing, our movements affect our balance, especially when we make large and fast movements. I'd like to give you an example with my cello. When playing the cello, the right side of our body moves in this arc. Sometimes very, very fast indeed. The left side moves in a completely different plane, forwards from our body and backwards from our body. We can easily compensate for lack of balance by stiffening our legs, back, hips or shoulders. But as I demonstrated before, this will block your ability to make sound. So we must examine and learn how we balance and find that minimum tension, allowing us to move freely with the least effort. A good balance position I recommend is to have both feet flat on the floor, creating a stable and broad base 
a quadrupod with your two sitting bones. That way the extreme movements out to the side, forward and backwards, are supported comfortably and within your relaxed structure. The same would apply for players standing up. Feet close together gives very little balance. Feet further apart better supports the imbalances created higher up. Our aim must be to master the use of momentum, of movement and natural weight and the way we flow and balance. Now I'd like to explain what happens when our body movements meet the string and how the string resonates, ultimately turning our energy into sound. Let's first look at pizzicato. When you first pull the string away from its resting position and put strain on the string, as though you were drawing a bow, an arrow, there's no sound. It's not until you release the string that the sound starts. Your energy prepared the sound, and when you released your energy, the string springs back and moves freely back and forth. That movement, that oscillation, creates vibration. The vibration is transmitted into the body of the instrument. The higher frequencies go down the bridge foot and into the belly, and then very quickly through the sound post to the back of the instrument, which resonates. The bass, the lower frequencies, tend to come through the bass foot into the belly, the front of the instrument, and they are helped to resonate the front belly by the bass bar underneath, which is like, acts a little bit like a spring. And those two planes, the back and the front of the instrument, vibrating, start to move the air within the cavity the instrument's cavity. And that cavity, those vibrations, escape through the F-holes and into the air around. And also, the, because the whole instrument is resonating, all of the air around starts to move as well. All of that movement of air is sound. So, the movement of the string is amplified by the body of the instrument. And this is fantastically different from the sound you get from an electric guitar before you attach it to the amplifier with its solid body which lacks an internal cavity. Plucking the strings on an electric guitar creates a tiny sound. Using the bow is much more complex than pizzicato. Each hair on the bow has thousands of follicles like hooks that make the hair coarse. By the way, the hair comes from the tail of a horse. We use rosin to add stickiness to the hair and rigidity to the follicles. The rosin is held by the follicles, but too much rosin blocks up the follicles and then the hair has no actual contact with the string. The contact is through the rosin. This is detrimental to sound production and to bowing techniques. In my view, the less rosin you use, the better. The problem is when the hair wears, too many follicles are broken, then it becomes too smooth. And that's when we start to use more and more rosin. It's much better to have the bow rehaired. The question of the quality of the bow hair used by the rehairer and the techniques they use is a topic I won't bang on about now, otherwise I'll be here all night. But if you have more questions about this, I can answer them later. With the bow, we have two basic approaches to sound production. Spiccato, when the bow plays a single note, pushing the string down and then quickly springing away, allowing the string to resonate freely. Spiccato is much like pizzicato notes. And legato, when the bow stays on the string, For legato, it's necessary to understand the physics in much more detail. Let's imagine a magnified view. 
First of all, the initiation of the movement of the string is the same as spiccato, but then the hair of the bow remains in contact on top of the string. The string is rising and falling and therefore the hair has to move with it. This enables the hair follicles to continue pulling the string and to encourage the string to continue resonating. However, the fact that the hair remains in contact with the string means that it's also restricting the free vibration of the string. This is a dichotomy we cannot avoid, but one we have to deal with incredibly carefully. In order for the hair to move with the string, the bow stick, the wood, must allow the hair to have this movement. The wood must also resonate sympathetically. And for the wood to resonate, your bow hold has to be nicely structured, but not stiff or tense. Your stiffness or tension will kill the resonance in the bow. You need to be able to transmit your energy through the bow to the string, allowing and encouraging it to respond as freely as possible, which means you first, you have to be free. Thinking about that minimum tension I spoke about, Try to feel the bow resonating on the string as you play. Start on your lower strings, where the bigger vibrations are easier to feel. Then work your way up. Feeling the vibrations in your fingers will be a sign that you are doing well. It's also important to understand why the position of the bow on the string has such a distinct effect on the sound. We understand that if we bow nearer the fingerboard, the sound is soft and less focused than if we play near the bridge. This is because playing near the centre of the resonating string, the bow is actually damping the oscillation. It can't ride on that size of resonance, so it restricts it and hence there is less sound. Playing near the bridge allows the string greater freedom to oscillate. However, it's harder to initiate movement of the string when you are close to the bridge because of the string's lack of flexibility at this place. We feel this when we pizzicato close to the bridge. So playing here, we have to put more energy into the string to get it moving and incidentally, the guitarists amongst you are experts of right hand positioning, using it constantly to vary the quality and volume of their sound. I find it interesting that the piano is designed with the hammers set to strike the strings close to one end of the string. And this is obviously optimal. Imagine the hammer trying to hit the string in the middle of its length, where the string is moving so much. For string players, as our left hand position moves up the instrument, we need to move the bow closer to the bridge in order to keep the correct relationship. Now, this may all seem obvious. You probably make these adjustments to some extent without thinking, but knowing the reason the string resonates well and understanding all the relationships will help you make more refined and decisive decisions in sound creation you will have much greater potential in sound production. Of course, it's not a simple matter of playing near the bridge. We know that playing too near the bridge can cause dreadful noises and crackings and squeaks. That's the reason many string players have an instinctive tendency to keep a safe distance from the bridge. What you need to know is that there is an optimal point what I call the golden line, where you can produce high level oscillations of the string, the greatest resonance, and thereby, if you choose, the greatest volume. To play on the line requires the most comprehensively good technical approach, incorporating all that I have said so far, posture, balance, structure, relaxation, minimum tension. Then, even when you play softly, playing on the optimal line will give your sound a greater range of harmonics 
and overtones, and the sound will carry so much better across the concert hall. It makes the listener feel the sound rather than just hearing it in the distance. When you want to play strongly, the bigger vibrations will feel more like tidal waves of sound rather than the harsh, narrow stream. <laughs> I'll give you a demonstration and I hope you'll be able to hear the difference, even though we're doing this through the internet rather than in a concert hall. So here's a little bit of Tchaikovsky Rococo variations. Um, first of all, playing away from the bridge. Hmm. speed and weight are also critical factors in playing on the line. Too fast and you skate, too slow and you crack. Each string demands a different approach. The lower string is the heaviest, the thickest string. It requires the greatest amount of energy input to start resonating and it takes longer to get started. If you play without enough weight and bow too fast, the bow will skate and the string requires more weight and less speed. In contrast, the top string being thinner and tighter does not like a comparable amount of weight. It prefers less weight and more bow speed. The strings in between are graduations from the bottom to the top string. This means that whenever you move from one string to another, you need to apply mm -hmm. this adjustment I know this seems perfectly obvious and something we probably do without thinking, but I guarantee if you become more aware and sensitive to each string's requirements, you will be also able to play more consistently on the golden line and you will improve your sound production massively. This brings me to mention the perception of volume. What we perceive as loud or soft is very much dependent on contrast and on what we have become accustomed to. Take, for example, the volume of music at a nightclub. It's loud, of course. It's what you expect. The volume at 11 p.m. is set at level seven. But by midnight, since everyone is so used to that level, it doesn't seem loud anymore. So the volume is turned up to level eight. By 2 a.m., it's up to level 10. If you were to walk into the nightclub at 4 a.m., the music would be so loud you'd literally not be able to cope. I've been in recording studios where they have speakers that can output sound way above the pain threshold. There is an electrical cutout set to well above that. I've been told that some pop musicians regularly hit that cutoff. It's their desire for the music to make a big impact, to generate more adrenaline. Pop radio stations set their broadcasting volume so that the music can be heard consistently well, whether you're listening to the, in the car or in any other noisy environment, including nightclubs. The recordings themselves are made to suit this. In contrast, classical music innately has a large dynamic range. You might have noticed when the BBC broadcasts classical music, there are times when it's hard to hear soft passages after loud sections. However, you'll sometimes find with other classical radio stations that you'll have less difficulty because they compress the volume levels. My point is that we quickly get used to a certain level of volume 
and then after it has changed to another level, we quickly get used to that too. Play as loud as you can for 20 seconds and before the end of that time, your audience will have become accustomed to that volume and not perceive it as loud. Since we cannot turn up the amplifier, we must employ other methods to stimulate the listener's adrenaline. Let's face it, however loudly you play a cello or even a piano is never going to be as loud as a trumpet or an organ. However, we do not need to feel frustrated by this because it's the change in dynamic, the movement upwards, the sense that a crescendo could lead to new heights that is stimulating. The excitement is in the change. If, for example, rather than a long crescendo passage building in a straight line, the line incorporates moments of release in tension and volume, finally arriving at a fortissimo, the listener will be stimulated by the movement and changes along the way, like they're riding a wave. They will feel the fortissimo as a dramatic arrival point, even if, in fact, it's only slightly louder than the start of the passage. It's very important that our sound is punctuated by moments of silence, places to breathe. If music has no silence, it is exhausting and irritating to listen to. If I talked to you and the sound of my voice was continuous, after a while you'd be desperate for me to stop, whatever I might be saying. The consistent sound would drive you mad. So in our playing, we need to create frequent breaks in our sound, giving the ear places to recover. Even the tiniest of silences is effective. The music gives us natural places for silences, places to breathe. These can be found at phrase changes and in the defined articulation around individual notes. With the use of silences, we also immediately create a much greater range in volume, which we need. The problem with bowed instruments is that we can all too easily play without any breaks in the sound. We can physically breathe while the bow continues indefinitely. The ability to make seamless bow changes is essential for when the music demands it but I do find that there's a common obsession in achieving the smoothest bow changes, which often leads to smoothing the sound over every join in the music. I call it ironing on the cello, and in my view, this ironing of the sound, losing the places to breathe and articulate, inherently stops the music from speaking, singing and communicating in a natural and expressive way. Think of singers and their necessity to breathe and to enunciate the words in the songs. It's just such a natural way to make music. Now I need to explain about the use of the left hand in sound production. String players are frequently fixated with the left hand. This is because of the complications of note patterns, including patterns across different strings, shifting, stretching, jumping, chords, double stopping, playing in tune and vibrato. The bow hand seems straightforward in comparison. The left hand can vary and adjust the sound that the right hand creates. It should be active in enabling the string to resonate correctly. To do this, one major technique that is invariably overlooked must be understood and implemented. The control of weight applied by the fingers on the string. It's mostly assumed that the string must be securely pressed to the fingerboard for every note. Much energy and strength is usually used to ensure this. A clamping action using a finger on the string and the thumb behind the neck is often used. This is all negative in terms of the creation of sound and vibrations. The string resonates most freely when it's not strongly clamped down to the fingerboard. Here's a demonstration. First I'm going to press my fingers down strongly and use lots of strength in my left hand. 
concerto but very lightly touching the string with the fingers of my left hand. <laughs> exhausting I felt more able to be expressive and I was able to produce more sound. When the string resonates on both sides of where your finger is placed it creates additional overtones and harmonics. This is what you have just heard in my second demonstration using very little weight in the left hand. The lack of strong pressure on the string doesn't interfere with the pitch of the note it simply enhances the sound. Tension from excessive pressing or clamping in the left hand is also detrimental to shifting, vibrato, stretching and to moving quickly between fingers. It leads to tension in the arm, shoulder and throughout the body. It thereby affects your freedom generally, including the movement of your right arm and energy and resonance to the bow. It also drains energy, all of which reduces your sound production potential and the quality of your sound. So left hand technique is about using the appropriate minimum weight. Do you remember in the practice lecture I talked about how we need to recognize how left and right hand sides should coordinate in natural and unnatural situations? Well, in sound production, we also need to find the right balance between right and left hand. Our natural tendency is to press harder in both hands at the same time when we want to play louder and to work less hard in both hands when we want to play quietly. Now we need to examine how our left hand can use an appropriate minimum weight. Determining the correct weight is dependent on how much weight you're applying to the string with your bow at any one moment. In general, we can think of it like weighing scales. More weight in the bow means less in the left hand. The bow pushes the string closer to the fingerboard, so the left hand has less to do. Less weight in the bow means more weight in the left hand. It's the opposite of one's natural approach. It's easy to find the correct weight of the left hand fingers on the strings. First, establish the weight you need in the right hand, which will depend on the character of the sound you desire, and then find the least possible weight in the left hand to balance that right hand weight. Start with almost no weight at all. You'll start with some whistling or the note breaks, then add a little more weight until you have your complete note, like this. <laughs> The art in this technique is to continually balance the left and right hand as the music changes. The adjustment of left hand weight is also useful for deliberately changing the colour of the sound. Adding more weight with the left hand fingers will make the sound drier, harder, like this. I'll find that note again. Now I'm going to add more weight. Don't be fooled into thinking this gives the sound focus to travel better. As I explained before, the more resonance, harmonics and overtones your sound has, the better it will be heard. I should also add that you can feel the vibrations of the string under your finger 
as you're playing. And the lighter you are on the string, the more you will feel that vibration. So that's a great indication that you're in, going absolutely in the right way with finding the balance between your hands. Another beauty in this balancing of weights is that you'll feel less general stress and tension, less tired, and you'll find it much easier to make greater quality of sound. This brings me to one of my golden rules, a fundamental that is crucial to string playing, bowing technique and sound production. Movement equals volume, weight equals character. As I explained earlier, the more the string resonates, the more sound is made. The, the more bow you use, the more the string can resonate. It's our basis of volume control. The adjustment of weight and therefore the tension of the string changes the character of the sound. For example, move the bow slowly with little weight in the right hand and you'll play quietly, piano, and the character of the sound will be soft or light. Now add weight to the bow and you will darken or give tension to the sound the volume remains piano. Now, for example, move the bow fast with little weight in the right hand and you automatically play louder. You add weight to the bow, which adds intensity to the character of the sound. But you will hear that the dynamic stays the same. Here's an exercise that seems almost absurdly simple, but it will help you discover how easy it is to make dynamic changes with remarkably little physical effort. Using one weight of bow, I'll move the bow slowly and then increasingly fast. And now on an up bow, I'll create that crescendo again. Now, still keeping one weight on the bow, I'm absolutely not changing the pressure with my right hand. I only change the bow speed. Here I'm going to play fast to slow. And now on the up bow. So please try this exercise and discover for yourself how easy it is to make crescendos and diminuendos and how bow speed equates directly to playing louder or softer. Here's another exercise focusing on sound character changes using changes of weight applied to the bow. I'm going to play Elgar and I want a serious, intense sound, but still in piano. So I'm going to use a fair amount of weight in the bow, but not much speed. speed but much less weight for a lighter character. Often the case that you want to add excitement or tension to a crescendo or reduce it in a diminuendo. So this is where you combine the two disciplines, adjusting the weight as you're changing the bow speed.
makes it may be very difficult to hear these subtle and sometimes not so subtle differences given the technology at your end and my technology in lockdown here. However, if you want to send in any questions or need me to clarify anything, head to the blackboard after the lecture. Please do try these three exercises and discover how simple and fundamental these bow control sound production rules are. Please also remember to keep separate in your mind and body the use of bow speed and the use of bow weight. They are two separate elements of our technique which we can use in infinite combinations to create the sound we desire. I want to quickly mention sound production when playing with others. If you're making good sound comprehensive resonance, it can dominate other sounds. In, on, in ensembles, we work on correct balance between the instruments, but there is more to balance than simple control of dynamics, of volume. We must be aware of the kind of resonance we're making. We must adapt our resonance to accommodate the musical needs, the conversation between the instruments. So when you're really able to make your instrument resonate wonderfully, remember to give others a chance to be heard. Give them silences to play into. Give them space for their airwaves in the room full of vibrations. Then hopefully they'll do the same for you. I have to tell you one quick story to finish with. I was rehearsing a piano trio in a concert hall in the Dolomite Mountains and suddenly the sound of my cello completely disappeared under my hands. And at the same time, the sound of the piano and violin disappeared, but we were still playing. After a few moments, we all stopped. In the silence, we became aware that the floor and the room was shaking. We were experiencing an earthquake. The extremely low resonances that were being created that we couldn't hear were shaking everything around us and this resonance was cancelling out all other sounds. It was a totally unexpected and extraordinary experience. Sound is music, art, science, physics and life. I hope this lecture gives you plenty to think about and enjoy. As always, I look forward to reading your questions and I'll be back soon. Stay well, keep safe and bye for now.